There we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience and your grace as we pivoted and got a new link. I'm so proud of all of you for finding it and for finding us today. I am Jamie Seward. I am the uh, Associ Associate Director Here's of Affinity Jamie's Engagement talking, Programs. We can't hear her with the Office of Alumni Relations. Um, just a reminder, if you are not a speaker today, please mute yourself um, and uh, I will keep talking. Um, sorry. So I'm here today with special guest, Dr. Lori Beth Finkelstein, Philip Franklin Wadley, Director and Curator of Evergreen Museum and Library. She's also the Interim Director of the Homewood Museum. And now before I turn the program over to Jim Williams, president of the Friends of the Libraries, I encourage you to ask questions in the chat. Can everyone hear me? Can somebody give me a thumbs up? I'm getting that some people can't hear me. Oh, good, some people can. All right, sorry about that for those who can't hear me. Hopefully that will improve. Um, so can. now I have the pleasure of turning the program over to Jim Williams. Jim, take it away. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jim Williams, president of the Friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries. Thank you so much for joining us for the first in our spring series of Lunch with the Libraries and Museums. This series of noontime talks is intended to give you an insider's look at the Sheridan Libraries and the University Museums and the innovative programs and services that they offer to the Hopkins community and wider public. It is made possible by a collaboration between the Johns Hopkins Office of Alumni Relations Affinity Engagement Programs and the Friends of the Libraries. In my time working with the libraries, I've been lucky enough to attend several events at the university's beautiful Evergreen Museum and Library. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to today's behind the scenes tour with the Evergreen's own director and curator, Lori Beth Finkelstein. As president of the Friends of the Libraries, I usually encourage our guests to consider supporting the Friends of the Libraries. But today, given the theme of our program, I would like to encourage you to also become a member of the Johns Hopkins University Museums. Members provide essential support for the Evergreen Museum and Library and the Homewood Museum, including educational programs, exhibitions, preservation, and collections care. If you become a member of the museums today, your membership will last one year from the time Evergreen and Homewood Museums reopen for in-person visits. You'll receive information on how to join in the follow-up email from today's program. Both of these museums are remarkable and if you haven't seen them, you're denying yourself a wonderful experience. So I hope you will join. Now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Lori Beth Finkelstein is the Philip Franklin Wagley Director and Curator of Evergreen Museum and Library and the Director of the Homewood Museum. She received her MA and PhD in US History from New York University and her BA from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She came to Evergreen in the spring of 2019 after a long career as a museum educator and curator at institutions including the Mount Vernon Hotel Museum and Garden in New York City, the Baltimore Museum of Industry, and the Maryland Zoo. Throughout her career in museums, Dr. Finkelstein has kept one foot in the classroom. She currently teaches undergraduate courses for the program in museums and society and provides, excuse me, and provides curricular support for the Master of Arts program in museum studies, both in the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. I'm sure you're going to find this a fascinating tour and we appreciate Lori for doing this. I will say, I asked her if she would show us where the museum, where the safe is kept within the Evergreen Museum and she's refused, but otherwise, I'm sure it'll be a very educational and interesting experience. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Jim, for that lovely and warm welcome. Just as a reminder, if you can all put yourselves on mute and turn off your videos, that would be fantastic. 
Welcome to Behind the Scenes at Evergreen, today's lunchtime lecture. As Jim mentioned, I had a career stint at the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore. And when I worked at the Maryland Zoo, one of the things that we would offer to visitors there were behind the scenes tours. And when you go behind the scenes at the zoo, you can possibly feed an elephant, pet a rhino, scritch a penguin. Uh, it's a pretty phenomenal experience, but it's very expensive. So today we're gonna do instead a behind the scenes tour of Evergreen. It is completely free, but there will be no petting of exotic animals or feeding of exotic animals. It'll just be you and me on Zoom. So uh, pull out your egg salad sandwich or tuna fish or whatever it is that you made yourselves for lunch, sit back and enjoy and join me as we go behind the scenes at Evergreen Museum and Library. Jamie, I am not able to advance my slides. Oh, let me try it this way. All right, there we go. Sorry, false alarm. Okay. So this, as you can tell, is the exterior of Evergreen. And I don't know how many of you have visited before. I'm gonna give a little, little bit of some background but I'm going to give most of this tour thinking that uh, those of you joining us today have some familiarity with the institution. And so um, if you don't, I'm happy to take questions in the chat at the end. And uh, you're also all welcome to email me. My email address is lfinkelstein at jhu.edu. So you should see my name on your screen first initial L, and then my last name at jhu.edu. And if we don't get to questions today in the chat, I'm more than happy to have you send me questions via email, and I will be glad to answer them. So here we are at the exterior of Evergreen. Very briefly, it was constructed in 1858 as a country estate for the, a family named the Broadbent family here in Baltimore, Maryland. And in 1881, the first of two generations of Garrett family members moved into Evergreen. They did major renovations to the house during the two generations that the family lived here. And the family occupied the house between 1881 and 1952. The house was bequeathed to Johns Hopkins University in 1942 when John Work Garrett, the second generation of Garrett's to live here, passed away and his wife remained in the house for another 10 years. And uh, today we operate as a historic house museum. We are owned by Johns Hopkins University and we have a partnership with the Evergreen House Foundation, which owns many of the works of fine art in the museum. Shh, follow me this way. I've noticed when I give Zooms that I bounce around in my seat a lot, and that's because I'm really a tour guide at heart. I got my foot in the door in the museum profession doing a lot of tours. I've given tours on buses and on boats and on land, and it's really hard for me to sit still while giving a talk, especially a talk that is supposed to mimic a tour. So I'm probably gonna be bouncing in my seat, and that is just me simulating having you with me here at the museum, because honestly, I would love nothing more than to be able to take you all along with me on this virtual tour of Evergreen. I'm probably also gonna overuse that come with me hand gesture. So, so be patient with me as I acclimate to doing what should be on foot on Zoom. Shh, follow me this way. I'm gonna take you to the staff only parts of Evergreen. Usually when we think of Evergreen, we think of this. We think of this parlor over here, the double parlor, both sides here where most of uh, our most beautiful works of fine art are shown. We think of the very famous gold bathroom installed in the house by Alice Whitridge Garrett, the first generation of Garretts to live here in the 1880s. And we think of the spectacular great library which was uh, built in the 1830s by John Work Garrett, the second generation of Garretts to live here. But we're not gonna talk about any of these things today because we're going behind the scenes. So we think of this and this and this, but not so much this. This is a back staircase. This is a service staircase. And I realized when I was putting this tour together that I, I didn't really have a theme except being behind the scenes and 
if my students had given me this tour, I would write all over it in red pen, what's the theme? So I gave it a little more thought. And I think really the theme of today's tour is not just behind the scenes, but more so that the front of the house cannot function without the back of the house. So you can't have this, and you can't have this, and you can't have this without this. This is a service staircase, and there are many staircases at Evergreen. Some are main, and I'll show you one in a minute, but most of them are what we would call behind the scenes, where the staff who cooked and cleaned and managed the house traversed the three floors of Evergreen in order for the front of the house to be beautiful and enjoyed by visitors and residents. So there are so many stairs at Evergreen. Here's one of the main staircases. And you can see that the handrail and the balusters are really quite more ornate when comparison to the more plain back staircase that I just showed you. This is a picture that I took from the very top of the stairs on the third floor, leaning all the way down. So you can see art hanging on the walls. You can see if you follow my cursor, a Tiffany chandelier. You can see a rug. You can see the mosaic floors, mosaic tile floor on the ground floor of the house. And I only got a little vertigo taking this, just a little bit. This is another fascinating staircase at Evergreen. This is the staircase that if you were to come for a concert here at Evergreen, you would take to go from the gift shop down here up to the theater. And I took it from an angle, um, I was kind of behind um, a barrier and I really enjoyed this angle very much because you can actually see that the staircase has a curve to it, which I had actually never noticed when I've stood down um, on the ground floor. So um, just another interesting staircase here at Evergreen. This one would have been built in the 1880s when this part of the house was added on by the first generation of Garretts to live here. And it would have originally taken family members and visitors from a billiard room where our gift shop is today to a gymnasium on the top floor where the three boys who grew up here would have um, exercised and also had tutoring with a private tutor. And today, of course, it's our theater. It was converted into a theater in the 1920s by Alice Warder Garrett for performances that she gave and also for performances by musicians. One of the interesting things about the staircases at Evergreen is that you have to go down to go up. And this is the result of the fact that there have been many renovations to the house over the years. The house had an original staircase, this one, though it was adjusted over time, and it had one back service staircase. But other service staircases were added as the house were expanded. And as a result, you have to go down to go back up. So my office is up here, kind of off screen. And when I wanna go visit my colleagues on this side of the building, I have to walk downstairs, walk along a little landing and walk back up again. And I'm gonna say, you can really eat a cheeseburger and French fries every day for lunch at Evergreen and not gain a pound because we walk so many stairs throughout the house. And at the risk of oversharing, you have to be very strategic about how much coffee and water you drink when you work at Evergreen when your office like mine is on the third floor and the restroom is all the way down on the first floor. Here's another fascinating staircase. This is a metal, a circular staircase, as you can tell, and it goes through essentially a hole cut in the ceiling. We believe that this staircase was put in the house around 1906, which was when John Work Garrett and Alice Warder Garrett were married. And they used the top floor of the house um, as a place where they lived when they would stay here um, until 1920 when John's mother, Alice, Garrett passed away and John Work Garrett and his wife Alice Warder Garrett inherited the house and started to make a lot of their own renovations to it. This staircase is in the location of what had been a servant's restroom and so you can see quite well in this photograph how it was you can see there's a window in the back which must have been the window in the restroom and the staircase just is is through a hole right in the ceiling up to the top floor of the house and when you walk up this 
staircase, you come to this landing. And then if you put your head up, you see this beautiful stained glass skylight right up above you at the top of the stairs. And then if you turn around and walk down a hallway, you come right in here, which looks remarkably similar to where I'm sitting in this Zoom. So you're doing a bit of a double take. Um, I am in fact in my office here at Evergreen, and this is my office, and it is one of the third floor bedrooms in the original part of the house. Servant's wings. I've mentioned servants a little bit, and I've mentioned servant's staircases, and I'll talk very briefly now about how the servant's part of the house really is truly behind the scenes. So if you were to come for a visit to Evergreen, this is again part of the house that you wouldn't see. I'm showing on the left side of my screen a historic photograph of Evergreen that if you attended some talks that I gave over the summer called Evergreen Exteriors, you would have seen um, this image. And I spent quite a bit of time during those summer talks explaining how the house expanded over time. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that today, but I do wanna just point out where this oval is the two different servants wings to the house because it's hard to understand um, how it all functions um, in terms of staff areas if you don't kind of have an aerial view. So there's actually two servants wings to the house. There's an older one here and that's what you're seeing in these photograph, in this photograph on the right side of your screen. And then there's a newer servant's wing that got added later. So the first one was added in the 1880s and the other one in 1906, around the time that the hole got poked in the ceiling to add the circular staircase. So this part here that you see is the um, older servant's wing shown in the photo here. And again, more staircases, <coughs> staircases leading out a back door, staircases leading up to a third floor. If you were to come to a performance at Evergreen, you would be looking at our stage, which is essentially on the other side of this wall where my cursor is. And you can access the stage right through here. And our performers use this room right in here as a changing space. So this is now really all back of the stage at Evergreen but originally it would have all been servants quarters and there's restrooms on this floor and several other um, small former servants bedrooms that have openings that look just like this. This is the 1906 servants quarters and you can see um, they're brighter, they're airier. Again, more staircases for servants to be able to go to the different floors of the servants wing without having to traverse the main house. And again, this would be a opening to a servant's bedroom here, servant's storage over here. Here's another view of the same hallway. And uh, you can see that the rooms are quite close together by looking at the doors. And that's because they're quite small, meant to accommodate one or two servants. And today we use this part of the house for collections, storage. Another view, again, you'll notice there's both cupboards for storage, um, some freestanding cupboards, closets, and also bedrooms and bathrooms. So um, you're wondering, why is she showing me ductwork? This is, uh, to me, a fascinating photograph because I'm taking a picture from the new servant's wing out over the roof of the old servant's wing. Um, we have actually done internally some really interesting talks on the on the mechanical systems in Evergreen. And you can kind of see a little bit of how we've added air conditioning to Evergreen up here because there actually is some ductwork, but I'm not going to go into that today. But scroll back with me here for a minute. I am taking the picture basically right out of a window over here, looking at this roof line, at the little space that exists between the 1885 servant's wing and the 1906 servant's wing. So that's just me cramming my head out the window. And behind me is essentially a hallway that looks like this. More stairs, come with me on a journey to the third floor. So this is a staircase um, in the original part of the house. And if you walk up it, you will be here. So we just walked, we virtually walked through this door together, came down this hallway, 
And again, we looked up like we did after the circular staircase and we see this beautiful skylight. This skylight was added to the house by T. Harrison Garrett, first generation of Garretts to live here. He and his wife, Alice Whitridge Garrett, made extensive renovations to the house in the 1880s, including removing chimneys to add this beautiful skylight. This third floor of the house has had multi-purposes over time. It has been used as uh, bedrooms for the children who lived here and servants space, we believe, by the first family to live here, the Broadbent family, when they originally built the house in the 1850s. This is how this space was, uh, we believe, imagined by T. Harrison Garrett. When he added the skylight, he wanted to convert this top floor of the house into essentially a museum to showcase his collection of prints and rare books. He was a formidable collector and really um, had hoped for this to be a, a space to take friends and acquaintances and fellow collectors and showcase his collections. And I would love down the road to really um, dig into this idea of Evergreen is a museum, not starting in the 1950s when Johns Hopkins and the Evergreen House Foundation start to give tours here, but really going back to the 1880s when T. Harrison Garrett started to conceive of this house as a place to showcase his collections. But um, we don't know to what extent this, uh, this um, installation was realized in the 1880s by him. He dies soon after a lot of these renovations to the house take place. And we really think that most of this third floor of the house was used as bedrooms for, by the three um, Garrett sons who lived here. And as I said before, also when the Broadbent family lived here in the 1850s and 1860s as bedrooms for their children and for their servants, they had a much larger family they had, um, I believe, eight children and who must have shared rooms up here. And so what do we use this space for today? Up here today is office space and also collection storage. So if you look here, um, this is uh, a door on the other side of this radiator. And if you open it, you will be here. This is the office of our collections curator, Michelle Fitzgerald. Michelle, I don't know if you're on this call, but if you are, thank you for letting us show your office. You left it very tidy before the pandemic and it has stayed that way. You can see that um, Michelle was in the process of uh, processing some photos from our photo collection. And we do periodically use this space during quarantine. We, we come into the museum individually with a lot of social distancing to work on some projects. And I too have been doing some work on the photographs that you see there. So again, this is in the original part of the house. And we're up here on the third floor together in an office. Bathrooms. So many bathrooms at Evergreen. There are six full bathrooms and five half bathrooms at Evergreen, plus two full public restrooms. And when you visit Evergreen, I'm going to scroll back here. This is the bathroom we show you, the beautiful gold bathroom. This is not one of the bathrooms we show you, but it's actually fascinating to discuss. We believe it was added to the house in the 1880s when the first generation of Garrett's made a lot of um, renovations to the interior of Evergreen and also expanded the house greatly in size. You can see that there are really exquisite, likely minton tiles, all on the walls here, marble, a newer toilet peeking out of the corner, and um, a stone floor with a beautiful stained glass window. So to orient you a little bit to where this third floor bathroom is in the house, it's, <clears throat> if you're familiar with um, the outside of the house, you're up here on the third floor, you're right above the gold bathroom. We are fairly certain that the gold bathroom was created in the space of an existing bathroom that was on that was constructed in the original house at Evergreen in the 1850s. Um, it was would have been incredible to have indoor plumbing in the 1850s in this house. So it gives you a sign of really um, the extent to which it was a grand home. Um, at the time of its original construction, 
before any of the additions were even put onto it. So we believe that the gold bathroom, as I said, was constructed in the location of what had already been an extant bathroom in the house. And then the bathroom that I just showed you got added on top of it, possibly in a location that had either been a bedroom or storage space. And then underneath the bathrooms, you see this little bump out. This is the butler's pantry, which is uh, part of, again, these 1880 additions to the house. And it expanded an existing pantry in the house and made it larger. And the tile work in this pantry are quite similar to the tile work up here. And I'm just showing you two different views. So for those of you who visited Evergreen, this is the Put Cochere. You would um, enter here to go to the gift shop on the left. And again, this is the window over here. So we were up there on the third, third floor of the house. More bathrooms. For those of you who have visited Evergreen, you have likely seen um, Alice Warder Garrett's bathroom. Alice Warder Garrett was John Wood Garrett's wife. She was the second Alice to live in the house. As I mentioned, the couple got married in 1906. And Alice and her husband lived in the house on and off during John Wood Garrett's diplomatic career, where he served in many different countries. And they settled here more permanently after John Wood Garrett's mother, Alice Whitridge Garrett, dies in 1920. And between the 1920s and the 1940s, they make many uh, alterations to the house and modernize the house in many ways. And you can see just aesthetically how much more modern this bathroom looks compared to the others that you've seen. Um, there's very sleek wood paneling, um, geometric shapes. It's very unadorned. Alice Warder Garrett's taste was the antithesis of the Victoriana that was very much a part of the design of Evergreen when the first generation of Garrett's lived here. So this is a much more streamlined aesthetic. And there's a secret door. It looks like all the other doors. Perhaps you think it's a closet door, ah, but it's not. If you walk through this door, you come to another door on the other side of it. And if you open that door, you come to what was a laundry room that today is um, collections um, processing. And we're, we are, we've been using this time that we are closed to the public to really dig into a lot of different collections management projects. So some of my behind the scenes photos might look a, a little messy, but it's really just us doing museum work to make sure that we are caring for our collections in uh, the most in the most careful ways possible. So behind the bathroom, you come to this laundry room space. These would have all been um, closets used for linens. There's a doorway here that would actually take you out to the roof, a terrace area of the roof. And the laundry room behind the bathroom was quite clever because what it meant was that the staff of the house could, um, could launder linens that could then be put through those doors into the bathroom. And it also meant that Alice's clothes could be pressed by the staff of the house, oops, and then hung for her right inside her uh, bathroom and dressing room. So a really smart, interesting use of space. Again, for those of you who heard my talks over the summer, I talked a lot about a conservatory that had been built um, on the second floor of the house in the 1880s. And this laundry room takes the space of what had been that conservatory. I'm trying not to repeat too much of that presentation, uh, but again, I'm happy to answer questions after. And there's a laundry room sink. Stairs to nowhere. They don't really go nowhere. Right outside the laundry room is this flight of stairs and they go to a door and they actually take you to a landing on the roof that again functions as a terrace. Because there's been so many alterations to the house over time, the roof lines don't all match up. And as a result, there's areas where doors can open and allow um, a roof one flight below where one is to function as a terrace. more passageways. So for those of you who have visited Evergreen, you've probably been on tour in this room. We call it the garden room. Um, until about a month ago, I thought it was called the garden room because it was painted green, but that's not the case. It's called the garden room because if you were to look out these windows over here, you would look down at the beautiful Italianate gardens that are at the rear of Evergreen. 
Um, in this room, which would have been used by guests and visitors to Evergreen, there's also a secret passage, a little hallway that takes you to this door and a closet. And if you walk through this door, look where we are. We're in another bathroom. So this is a bathroom that we do interpret for the public on the second floor of the house. And if you were on a tour with us, you would enter it from this second floor hallway. And this is how you would see it. So you can see I'm kind of fascinated by the bathrooms of Evergreen. Uh, and I was actually supposed to give a talk uh, over the summer that was canceled due to the pandemic in Washington, DC on the history of plumbing at Evergreen. And I'm really keen to, to put that talk together and give it eventually and hopefully perhaps be able to share it with all of you. Um, I will make a quick segue to also mention, it was said earlier at the talk um, by Jim and by Jamie that I'm also the director at the Homewood Museum. And at Homewood, we are about to start to do some renovation work to the outside privy. Um, that is on the grounds of the Johns, uh, Johns Hopkins University, the Homewood campus that had been the privy for the Homewood mansion. And uh, I'm really interested in starting to make some connections between uh, how uh, plumbing and human waste was managed at Homewood in the early 1800s and how it changes over time by the mid 1900s and early 1900s or mid 1800s and early 1900s at Evergreen. So um, join me for more bathroom talks in the future. Let's go downstairs to the kitchen. So we're going to go all the way back down to the main floor. And again, if you've been on tour at Evergreen, you've probably seen the kitchen. Um, a really fantastic space where, uh, again, you can see those minton tiles. Uh, and we also, you know, we use this space to, to talk about um, the types of visitors who came to Evergreen and what they would have eaten when they come and also to give a glimpse into the life of the people who would have worked at Evergreen. And part of the work at Evergreen involved using these back passageways so that you were not um, interrupting events and parties and gatherings at the house. And so I'm giving you a clue as to what might be behind this door. This door actually has a chair in front of it right now, and I'd never paid it much attention until I started to put this tour together. And then I thought, hmm, I should know where that door goes. So I thought for a minute and I realized, aha, this is a close up of it. What's behind this door? Oh, there's the chair. What's behind this door? It opens to this. So if you were to walk through here and shut the door behind you and turn around, this is what you would see. And this door leads you to a part of the house that will then put you in close proximity to all these connected service staircases. You can see a small glimpse of the mosaic floor. And you can also see this door over here on the right side of my screen with the staff only sign and that door will take you into the basement. There are multiple basements at Evergreen. I'm not quite ready to do a behind the scenes tours of Evergreen's basements, but maybe we will do that in the future. Um, one thing to help keep the front of the house separate from the back of the house, just as you look at these slides, is the color palette. Um, the back of the house is painted a, a golden yellow and the doors are all burgundy. Uh, you're not gonna use as high quality materials back of the house as you are at the front of the house. So the doors are not um, wood uh, that has been, uh, you know, that has a finish on it. They're not a sort of very uh, black, thick lacquer paint that you've seen in some of the other doors of the house, perhaps. It's just a more simple paint. And as I mentioned before, that's also true of the handrails here, more simple balusters and more simple handrail. Let's go back to the kitchen. So in this kit, in the kitchen, perhaps if you've ever visited, you've noticed there's this little door that opens. Where does it go? Well, if you were to open it and poke through, your head would poke through right into this room. This is currently the docent's break room. Uh, you can see our bulletin board here, which is sort of like a time capsule from back when we were open. We took a trip to Glenstone once with the docents. That was fun. Um, and, and there's a bookcase in here and, and uh, the docents and the staff enjoy their lunch in this space. And it was originally where the servants would take their meals which could be passed to them through this hole in the wall. What's behind this door? Again, we're still in the kitchen. 
a modern staff kitchen. The refrigerator is blocking our microwave, but if you were to work at Evergreen or be a docent at Evergreen, you might enjoy a cup of coffee or some toast from our toaster, handy first aid kit, all the accoutrements of a modern kitchen nestled right behind the historic kitchen. This space was not added on uh, by us uh, to be a staff kitchen. It was part of the uh, original kitchen originally and probably served as a space for very large ice boxes. Uh, a larder essentially would have been in here. And there was a, a, a renovation to the museum in the 1980s that added an elevator and that added this staff kitchen and that also added a catering kitchen and public restrooms. So we're gonna wrap up here. And um, I think we're actually doing great on time in terms of questions. We'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, this is what I'm showing you on your left side of the screen is the theater. And it's a little bit of a dark photo, but if you peer through the oval with me, peer through the oval with me, you'll see a dark, a dark little hallway over there. And that little dark hallway is opens to a closet. And inside that closet is this wood paneling. And you wonder, what is that? Well, first of all, you can see this is where we store the chairs that you sit on when you come for concerts at Evergreen. But lining the walls of this chair closet are these wood lockers. And these would have been the lockers where the three Garrett sons would have stored their belongings and where perhaps friends and family members joining them in their gymnasium and their bowling alley for a day of fun would have stored their belongings. So I'm going to show you one last photo, which is a, an original view of what this theater area would have looked like. And if you look closely, you can see what I think are more lockers in the photograph. So let's take a look. Um, I tried to adjust the, the um, exposure as best I could. I, I, I appreciate that it's hard to see, but um, same ceiling. I'm going to scroll back in a minute. And to me, this is similar to the lockers that I'm showing you. And this is all the gymnasium equipment that would have been up here uh, in this space that eventually becomes the theater at Evergreen. So that wraps up my behind the scenes at Evergreen tour. Uh, no live animals were involved, but hopefully you all enjoyed your lunch and learned a few new things. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and would be happy to take some questions for a few minutes in the chat. So, Lori, I wanted to share that I have been keeping track of many of the questions. Um, so I, I didn't, I know sometimes they get lost in the chat. So um, if it's okay, I'll just ask you the ones I've seen so far and then we can see um, what else comes in. So Perfect. Um, first of all, are eight-year-old children allowed on a tour of the museum? Children are certainly allowed on the tour of the museum. And I don't know who so kindly teed me up with that question, but uh, we're actually in the process of designing a hands-on art program for children and their families. We had it all ready to launch right before we closed down due to the pandemic, thanks to generous funding from the Maryland State Arts Council. And we will be reviving that program when we reopen. So not only can children come to Evergreen, but children can come to Evergreen and have some really fun hands-on art experiences with us. Well, that sounds amazing. I'm excited to bring my kids by. I'm sure they'll get a lot out of it. Um, so another great question, how many servants would have been needed to run the household? So uh, that's a question with many answers and it really depends what time period you're speaking about. We are now in the process of trying to understand through the use of census records uh, more deeply how the house was staffed. We know that the Broadbent family had uh, about eight children and I think about eight servants of their own. And that was when the house was much smaller. So they were probably all living up on that third floor together. Uh, when the First, when John worked, when um, T. Harrison Garrett and Alice Whitridge Garrett lived here with their three sons, John um, being the eldest of them, and Horatio and Robert, uh, there was servants. Um, I don't know how many, but they were only occupying that first servants' wing. After 
T. Harrison Garrett dies, the house gets shut down for many years essentially, and uh, three sons go off to New Jersey to attend college at Princeton, and their mother Alice moves uh, up there with them. They travel extensively, and the house doesn't really get opened back up until the 1890s. And at that point, um, renovation plans start to be made to add that second servant's wing. And we think at that time, there were a lot, many more servants living here. The servant question is also complicated because all the servants staying here were not necessarily employed by the Garretts. When visitors would come, they would bring their own servants with them who would use some of the rooms. Additionally, not everyone who worked here lived here. So let me just say that again, I flubbed my, my speaking a little bit. Not everyone who worked here lived here. Some people worked here and lived in their own homes and would come here and work for the day. There were also other uh, houses, cottages essentially on the property where workers lived, including where the gardening staff may have lived. So it's a very complicated question to answer. We do know that by the 1840s, um, especially after John Mark Garrett dies, there's not many people living here as staff. Um, there's a family named the Bresci family who live here. They um, came back from Italy with Alice Warder Garrett and continue to work for her here at Evergreen. And we've actually have had um, some very nice relationships and done some oral histories with members of that family. I will say that I've talked about servants before and people have reached out to me with information of their own family histories of having family members who worked here at Evergreen. So if you have any of those connections and you wanna contact me, um, we're really curious to learn about all the different families who made this house function. So please reach out to me. Quick question, long answer. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So we, you mentioned the Broadbents. How did they get their money? He, um, so Stephen Broadbent, from what we understand from city directories, was a lottery dealer. Unfortunately, we don't really know what it means to be a lottery dealer in the 1850s and 60s. And there's a fascinating story with the Broadbents as well. Um, he's an English immigrant. We believe the house is built on land that his wife's family owned. And it was part of essentially a development of large estate homes in this part of Baltimore, now the city, then the county. And if you're familiar with the Noyes Alumni House on the Notre Dame campus, just north of us, that house is architecturally very similar to Evergreen and we suspect we're built around the same time period. Well, fascinating. Um, so this is a good question. <clears throat> were there enslaved people on this property and what was their role and how and when were they freed a lot sorry so again it's a question that we've been asked before and it is a question that is very important for us to investigate further we do not know whether or not the broadbent family had enslaved individuals with them on this property there is some very um, slim evidence that perhaps suggests Stephen Broadbent may have um, owned an enslaved person, but we're in the process of doing much more research to better understand that and to better understand the nature of the workforce here on this property when the Broadbent family was here in the 1850s and 1860s. Census records indicate that the servants who would have worked for the Broadbents in residence at this house were Irish um, or English immigrants, but we really need to do more research. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that Johns Hopkins University has been very fortunate to receive a Mellon grant to investigate our difficult histories and also to look more closely at issues of diversity. And on the Evergreen side, we will be working um, as, as partners in that grant to do more research precisely on this question. And um, next year, we'll hopefully have a research fellow assisting us in that endeavor. The Garrett family does not move onto this property um, until the, we think 1880, and they don't own the property until the late 1870s. And by then, of course, slavery had ended in the United States. So it's really a question of investigation for the time period when the house was under ownership 
um, by the Broadbent family and by some other individuals as well in the 1850s and 1860s. Well, thank you. So I want to pivot now and ask you some questions about the um, house itself. Um, was the kitchen always in the house? So good question is, we believe there was always a, a we believe there was always a kitchen in that vicinity of the house that I showed you today, but it was not that original kitchen. Um, if I, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen one more time and I'm gonna try and show everyone an image. Bear with me. So if you, if you travel back with me across 32 slides very fast without getting seasick, Let me see if I can find this. We're doing well on time. So I think, here we go. Okay. So it's a little hard to tell in this photo. Um, and when I give an architectural talk, I usually go into more detail on this. But if you look here, okay, this is the original, original block of the house. And you can see there's a little piece that juts off the back of that block. That little piece, it's not the... It's not the width of the whole house. That little piece off the back is likely where all the service functions of the original house built in the 1850s lived. I am not certain it was always two stories. I think it might have been one story. And back there is where you would have had a kitchen and other service areas of the house. Um, so uh, there was also likely in the 1850s several outbuildings that would have supported food preparation. There was probably um, an ice cellar. There was probably um, something that functioned as a root cellar because there just was not the modern technology of refrigeration that we would have had now. There would have been a hearth. The stove you saw in the image was a gas stove. So um, all things that we're interested in investigating further. Interesting. So along with the, the kitchen, um, when did laundry move, rooms, sorry, move into the house from outside? So again, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know much. I'm, I'm intrigued. I don't know who asked that question, but now I want to do an entire history of laundry at Evergreen. Thank you for whoever asked that. I will say that originally the laundry function was in the basement. And I think it continued in the basement even when that little ironing room was added. And I probably for clarification shouldn't have called that a laundry room because when you hear that, you think of the laundry rooms like we have today. And I actually lived in a house in Madison, New Jersey, so shout out to Madison, um, where my laundry room was off my bathroom, but it was a washer dryer, right? And behind, behind sliding doors. Uh, but even in the 1920s, you would not have been able to use that small space to address all your laundry needs, especially for a house this size, which would have had a tremendous amount of linens that needed to be washed and pressed. We today have a washer dryer actually in the basement at Evergreen and an ironing board. Um, and we have a great story that we'll share with you all at a happy hour sometime about um, our laundry room at Evergreen. I'm not gonna go into it now. I'm just chuckling to myself. Um, so we actually still use the basement as, as a laundry room here at Evergreen. And that room I showed you would have been much more of like, a, I would call it a pressing room or an ironing room, which is not something we have as much anymore today. Um, I will say really quickly, I remember when I was a kid growing up, my grandmother in her house had an ironing board that was behind a little door. And you open the door and the ironing board plopped down right in the kitchen. Um, which goes to show even in the 19, you know, 50s and 60s, whenever that house was built, how much more ironing we do than today, because I don't think houses are built with those anymore. No, that's fascinating. I love that we're getting into the nitty gritty of like what everyday life might have been like. I will crawl down any rabbit hole. You all let me. <laughs> I have one little rabbit hole for you. Did spouses use the same bathrooms and bedrooms? Okay. Um, if only I could pull up another PowerPoint. So, okay. That bathroom that I showed you of Alice's, that was added on to the house by Alice and John, probably in the 1930s or 40s, into what had been sort of like a conservatory space on, the, um, on one of the roofs of the house. At the far end of that hall, so if you, at the far end of the hall where that bathroom is, at the other end was what would have been um, John's bathroom, 
which was built into what had probably been a small study at the end of the hall. I'm going to share screens one more time and then Jamie, you just tell me when I can't go on anymore and I will stop. I'm going to show you all something. Some of you, this is repetitive for, but but you're, some of you are asking questions, which are leading me to believe that um, I'm not being repetitive. So let me go back one more time. So if you look closely at this picture, you see two little bump outs right where my cursors are. Those were two bathrooms that were added by the Garretts in the 1880s to Evergreen to, um, in addition to the one interior bathroom that became the gold bathroom. And there was another bump out like this on the other side of the house. The two on this side of the house get removed in the 1930s when they start to do, and 40s when they start to do renovations to add on the library. Um, so to orient you, there's right now one bathroom here and Alice's bathroom is all the way back here at this back part of the house. Great, uh, that's very interesting. She had a nice view of the garden. Um, so let's switch to the kitchen real quick. So high on the wall of the kitchen were hooks. Do you know why there were hooks or what the hooks, the purpose of the hooks was? I'm just gonna keep the presentation up. Let's do that. All right, let's, let's go to the that. kitchen. Let's take a peek. Let's go back to the kitchen. You don't even have to get up. Maybe you've all moved on to your cookie after your lunch. Stay with me. I'm gonna go to the kitchen. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm looking for hooks. Does the person who asked the question wanna unmute and tell me what they're curious about? Lori, she's asking about the, the hooks that had the bells. Oh, the okay. Thank you. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank, thanks. Hi, Robin. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, yes, yeah, so there's an entire, um, throughout the house, there's an entire, um, essentially, old-fashioned intercom system that allowed bells to be rung in different rooms and notify staff in the kitchen. Um, I actually... In one in the bathroom that I showed you, the bathroom with the passageway from the garden room, you can actually see a button for one of the versions of the intercom systems in the house. So, and that's very typical in large houses for staff to be summoned that way. Very interesting. Um, I know I'd like a bell in my house. I just scream. Yeah, right. Or I use my cell phone. Um, so, is uh, this is a really interesting question and maybe our last one, um, but what is the origin of the name Evergreen? So, my, so the house originally was called Glen Mary when the Broadbents built it. And my understanding is that the name transitioned to Evergreen because of the many green trees that are coniferous on the property. Well, that certainly makes sense. I'm going to scroll back. I, I, everyone, I hope you didn't get seasick. There you go. Um, and I'm actually, Jamie, if I may, there's one last slide that I didn't put up because I was so excited that I finished on time that I hopped right out of this presentation. And so if you all indulge me for just one minute, I'm just going to take you to this slide where I can express my gratitude to JHU Sheridan's Libraries, the Evergreen House Foundation, and JHU Museum members for their support of Evergreen Museum and Library, and Jamie to you and your Affinity Engagement Program, part of the Office of Alumni Affairs, for welcoming us to your platform today. I would love it if all 156 of you, that's how many people are on this, if all of you visited museums.jhu.edu and heed Mr. James Williams call to learn more about us and to consider becoming museum members. We have been closed for almost a year to the day. We've not been doing any public programs. We've not had any special fundraising events. We would love to be able to continue to bring you this virtual programming free of charge at a deep, deep, steep discount 
compared to a behind the scenes tour at the Maryland Zoo in Baltimore, but we sure would love your help and support making all that possible. So please visit our website, please consider becoming a member or supporting us in other ways. And please visit our website to learn about other upcoming programs, both at Evergreen Museum and Library and our sister museum, Homewood. We have some great, great programs coming up at both places and also a joint program coming up in April where, Jamie, if I may just quickly plug this, where uh, my colleague, our curator of collections, Michelle Fitzgerald and I will be talking about uh, the Asian decorative arts collections in both houses and how they relate to each other. And um, also just one more quick plug, at the end of April, we are gonna be doing a joint program with our friends at Cliveden, a historic house in Philadelphia, which has family connections to Homewood, I'm not going to tell you more because maybe now you're very curious and you'll visit our website. I'm not sure that program is up yet, but others are. So please stay in touch with us. Please email me any questions that you might have. L. Finkelstein at jhu.edu. Thank you so much for spending your lunch with me. Yes, thank you so much. Um, you will get a follow up email with a lot of information and a recording of this program. And I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being flexible with us as we change Zoom rooms. Um, hopefully it didn't uh, inconvenience you uh, much, uh, if at all. And we appreciate your time. We appreciate Dr. Lori Beth Finkelstein and her time and talent this afternoon. And we wish you a safe, happy, wonderful weekend. And hopefully we'll see you at some of our programs soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.